to uh, to ground us in our land acknowledgement and mission today. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we would like to begin by acknowledging with humility that the land where we are today is a territory of the people of the Salish Sea. Their presence is imbued in the waterways, shorelines, valleys, and mountains of the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish peoples since time immemorial. And I'm coming today from the home of the Nooksack uh, tribal. And the mission of the North Sound Oral Health LEN is to create innovative partnerships and sustainable strategies to increase oral health and equity or equity, oral health equity and improve the quality of life for all people living in the North Sound uh, region. And as uh, Lisa said, I am Lynette on deck. I'm a school nurse corps administrator working at the ESD uh, Northwest Educational Service District in a Anacortes. I am the chair of the Oral Health Lynn for the North Sound. And I wanted to welcome you to this all Lynn convening. And I'll turn it back over to Lisa. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lynette. Um, I am just moving things around here on my um, my screen. I just, before we get going, want to share our um, agenda for the day. So let me get that up so everybody knows what we'll be doing. Um, we'll, we're already in the welcome and introductions. Um, from there, we're going to hear from um, Dr. Beth Mertz. And she's going to talk to us a little bit and set some uh, grounding for the day around the dental medical divide. Um, then we'll pop in for a little networking, get to know each other. And then Dr. Duback and others from the Lummi Dental Clinic will share some of the dental integration work that they are doing. And... Um, I even I'm going to catch myself and start this education right now. I've uh, already been shared that we need to retrain our brains to say oral health integration. So I already faux pod. So there we go. Um, and then from there, we'll take a little break. We will then do a deep dive with Dr. Susan Fisher Owens into oral health integration. Um, and then take some time together to really process the day of information that we received and see how we might be able to put some of what we learned into practice. And then we'll end, uh, bring it all together and that will be our day together. Um, okay, so let me just grab my notes here. Um, Please use the chat if you have anything you want to share today. If you have questions for any of the speakers after each of the session, we have allocated a little bit of time to ask questions. So at that point, you're welcome to come off of mute and or um, put them in the chat and I'll be monitoring the chat for those questions. Um, all right, so my name is Lisa Sony. For those who have not met me before, I am the network manager for the North Sound Oral Health LIN. Um, LIN stands for Local Impact Network. Um, and I've been in this role for not quite a year and a half. And um, it has been just a wild ride of learning all about the oral health care, oral health systems, um, getting to know so many amazing people in this community that are dedicating so much time and effort to this really important topic. So um, thank you for having me. And just to find out who's in the room, if you would be willing to chat out your name, pronouns, organization, and what is your favorite thing about this time of year? I know for me, it is the sunshine and the flowers. Um, I think that's probably pretty common in the Pacific Northwest here, but let us know uh, what you love about this time of year. So tulips, yes. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Well, I am so excited, yes, Sunshine, to talk about oral health integration today. Um, I think there is so much opportunity in this topic to bring and highlight oral health in the greater um, system of health and whole person care. And so hopefully you all will learn so much from these amazing speakers that we have. So as you're popping your name into the chat, we have a quick poll just to kind of further understand who's in the room. Ashley will get it going. And it and thank you to Ashley. She is um, working in the background here to keep this meeting on track. And we're just trying to understand what part, what sector do you work in? Um, so if you could vote on what part. We'll see who exactly we have in the room and what your focus is. All right, so we've had 16 of 42. We got, yes, I love that so many people in the North Sound are gardeners because it is like the best time of year. I used to live in Hawaii and I was like, ah, spring and fall, it doesn't matter. But now that I live in the Pacific Northwest, I sure hang on for those flowers to start blooming. All right, if you haven't voted, we'll give it one more second here and um, we'll see where everybody is. Ashley, I guess we can go ahead just in the interest of time, um, close the poll and maybe share the results. I feel like I'm waiting on bated breath. Who, who's here? Hmm, it's not coming up. Let's see. I can see it. Oh, you can? Okay. For some reason, I cannot. So I'm just going to close it. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, oh, now it's back. I don't know what's going on. I think it might be my computer. So I'm just Yeah, gonna... it closed on ours. Okay. It, thank you. It takes It takes everyone to have one of these Zooms, doesn't it? All right, so with no further ado, I am going to introduce our first speaker today. And I just want you all to know that I have amended, like shortened everybody's intro because all of the ladies that you're gonna hear from today are very accomplished and have done so much um, incredible work. So uh, if you would like to read their full bios, Ashley will throw the flyer um, for the event into the chat and it has their full bio. So I will give you the pared down version. All right, so Dr. Elizabeth Mertz is Associate Director of Research at the Health Force Center at the University of California, San Francisco, and is a professor at the School of Dentistry's Department of Preventative and Restorative Dental Sciences with a joint appointment in the School of Nursing's Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. She is also uh, affiliated with the UCSF Center to Address Disparities in Children's Oral Health. And her work covers a broad range of health workforce issues, primarily focused on dental care, including supply and demand of providers, healthcare regulation, state and federal workforce policy, delivery system design and finance, access to care and evolving professional practice models. So that was the bridge, the, the short version, <laughs> if you can believe it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mertz and to, to help us learn about the dental medical divide. Okay, thank you. Nice to be here, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. Mm -hmm. I'll just share my screen. Yeah. Okay, can you see that? Hopefully, hopefully you can. 
Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have three screens, so I always just need to make sure it's like on the right one. <laughs> um, okay, so I, uh, I was, uh, Lisa had reached out to ask me to uh, talk about a paper that I published actually in 2016. Um, so I'm gonna go through uh, that really detailed the broader history of the divide between uh, dental care and medical care in the United States. Um, I'm going to go over this really quickly. I've also provided her the PDF of the full article. So um, if, if the quick version isn't enough, <laughs> you can uh, uh, get that in and read the whole paper. Um, okay. So to start, um, I, sorry, I just need to be, there we go. Um, <clears throat> We, as most of you know, I'm sure all of you know, um, the dental delivery system really struggles to have the capacity to address um, what are, are the two primary oral diseases that are the most prevalent, um, which are tooth decay and periodontal disease. Um, and there have been multiple high-level studies, um, the Surgeon General's report, uh, the update to that report that happened in 2022 that was published by NIDCR, the Institute of Medicine has actually published three reports, uh, four reports um, about, it's now National Academy of Sciences, about dental benefits, dental financing, um, and the delivery system and um, others. And really all of these reports going back to the early 80s um, uh, have highlighted the system's failures um, and called for reforms to improve population oral health. Um, the <clears throat> see. So just a couple of the big differences between dental and medical. Um, and again, these this paper is a little dated, but um, my guess is that these would not be um, the differences maybe of uh, the specific numbers and not of the scale. Um, but for dental care, we've only got about 65% of the population covered. Um, that may go down significantly once the public health emergency um, kicks everyone off Medicaid. Um, the medic where in the after the Affordable Care Act, um, we're really able to get um, a much higher percentage of the population covered with basic um, health insurance. Um, right now, uh, adults utilize dental care annual utilization is about thirty six percent, um, and the medical setting it's um, upwards of eighty percent. Um, child utilization is better, but it's still only at 48% and over 93% um, of children have a medical visit uh, within an, in, a, in a year. Um, dental often says, well, we're just a small portion of healthcare um, because we're only 5% of annual healthcare costs, um, uh, which is about $111 billion as of 2016. Um, but within the medical categories, there's only actually, if you just think about each um, specialty in medicine, like we think about dentistry, so orthopedic surgeon or cancer care, there are only four medical categories that exceed dental. So it's actually the fifth largest um, uh, set of expenditures on a given set of healthcare um, uh, uh, problems. Dentists still work about four days a week, um, where physicians work much more than that. Um, I'm pretty sure that um, the dental and uh, medical, if you adjust it for hours worked, the dentists are still making more money. Um, their system is really set up as a small independent, um, and that's the majority, although that is changing, um, and that transformation has already happened in medicine, um, where uh, most uh, physicians are employees um, or parts of larger group practices. Um, the biggest piece really is that Medicare does not cover dental. There have been multiple different attempts to add dental in, um, but it is still um, not covered for the most part under um, Medicare. And under Medicaid, um, adult dental is optional. Um, so where in the medical care system, Medicare and adult Medicaid coverage um, make up the vast majority, um, if not more than half of the um, coverage of all the individuals in the country. And then finally, <clears throat> in the dental sector, um, you know, they're not there. We do have diagnosis codes um, and uh, those have been um, advanced, um, but they're not 
integrated into most electronic health records. And therefore, um, that sort of diagnosis-based um, payment system is, is pretty nascent compared to just whatever the dentist has done the treatment and, and they are, um, and that really limits um, some of the reforms. Um, <coughs> pardon me. So there's this historic separation um, in all of these different areas in workforce and education, dentists, dental hygienists, um, uh, dental assistants are um, educated in their own programs, not integrated uh, with the rest of the delivery system, even in an academic medical center um, uh, like UCSF, where we have nursing school, medical school, pharmacy school, and a dental school, there's one or two interprofessional um, seminars that the students take. And for the rest, it's really, it's really still separate. Um, the delivery system, for the most part, really does maintain two different sets of infrastructures. Um, there are some larger um, Kaiser Permanente Northwest health, um, health partners in, in the Midwest um, that have a dental component in, in a larger medical um, system, but even um, within those, they, they tend to oper be operationalized separately. Uh, dental insurance. There was a, a lot of fanfare when the ACA was passed because they required um, uh, pediatric dental care as one of the 10 essential health benefits and uh, thought that that might really drive um, the changes to some of the insurance design to really merge those. Um, but we haven't seen that um, really pan out. Um, federal and state policy, as I've covered already with Medicare and Medicaid, um, uh, really sort of treats the way they pay dental, the way they um, uh, engage with the providers and the way that they cover the population separately than the, the um, way they do with Medicare. Um, even scientific discovery and research, it's great that we have the National Institute for Dental and Craniofacial Research that funds our uh, dental research and um, uh, that is really vital, but then that also tends to get really isolated and then you don't get the crosses to um, NIDDR or NIA and some of the other groups. Um, and then finally, technology and infrastructure. Um, <laughs> UCSF just switched their electronic health record, the dental electronic health record to wisdom so that they could integrate with EPIC. Um, but it is um, it is a huge, huge challenge um, when you're trying to do a more integrated um, set of uh, healthcare services and you really don't have the technology or the infrastructure um, to even communicate back and forth. So what this creates is it creates a lot of externalities. So within the dental system, if you don't take care of patients and you don't cover patients, um, and you don't provide emergency access per patient, per patients, you actually make more money. So the, there is no cost to the dental delivery system of doing nothing about fixing these problems because all of those people end up in the emergency room. And because of EMTALA, or they just suffer or take their own teeth out, you name it, um, in some cases die. So, but no one is holding the dental system accountable for that. All those costs are borne by the medical care system and by patients. And then the reward in return, if they, if you do actually try to reform and try to um, you know, solve some of these problems, it just costs you more. And that reward actually, again, goes back to the medical system. So that by having a healthier population, by reducing emergency room visits, et cetera. So this sort of, this issue of this externalities is really without that integration uh, becomes very challenging because they're, um, ni neither side is gonna get the return on investment for doing the hard work. The whole system will and patients will, but the way the financing is, it, it doesn't work that way. So thinking about how we got here, um, you know, it goes way back uh, probably to the uh, 1800s uh, when uh, dental education first started. But you've, I've talked about this field isolation and this idea that it's really separated. And then because of state regulatory um, systems and the dominance of organized dentistry, we've seen real professional dominance over policy. Um, because the 
status quo has been relatively lucrative, the preservation of that status quo has been the focus of a lot of the effort by the dental field itself. And uh, again, not looking to integrate or have anyone else have control to really maintain that. Um, and this has really been um, bolstered by this ideology that professional training is really the only indicator of quality. So only if you are trained as a dentist can you, that it is only that. So there are not, you know, um, quality, quality measures and other things. We're starting to get some of those, but, but outside um, more um, uh, objective ways to measure some of these. Um, and that has, and they they really are resistant to any other systems of accountability because other systems of accountability threaten that um, professional dominance and threaten their um, control over the status quo, which means that then we get a very limited adoption of policy innovations, all of which would really be uh, rooted in um, becoming new systems of accountability. So this cycle just kind of continues. Um, thinking about separation versus integration, um, integration really promises uh, to improve the patient experience and outcomes uh, through better screenings and referrals and care coordination and really reducing overall costs through better prevention and early treatment. Um, and I know you're going to hear about some of the models that have been um, developed later today. Um, at the time I was writing this, there really weren't a lot of good clinical models on this, um, although there have been some in public health. Um, this was pre-COVID, so there's always that. Um, so, and in terms of maintaining separation, um, there's a couple of ways to think about this. Um, the the status quo um, is one, we just keep doing what we're doing, um, or we can adopt policy approaches that maybe have been tried in medical or behavioral health and transport them to the dental field. Um, I see limited utility in that because of the previous um, cycles that we've talked about and that resistance to accountability. Um, I do think it's important to continue to push at the federal and state level for um, parity on um, policy. Uh, so we have behavioral health parity, uh, and that was embedded in a standalone bill as well as in uh, Affordable Care Act and follow-up legislation and regulation, but we really do not have oral health parity um, at either the state or federal level. So as usual, there's lots of pilots, lots of tests of change are occurring. Um, it's really not clear whether efforts that are based in the 21st century science and information technology, interprofessional practice and population health can in any sustainable way be mapped onto what is essentially a 19th century delivery model. And I will add also a 19th century regulatory model. Um, at stake in these efforts is really whether these reforms that are undertaking will lead to a system that alleviates disparities and reduces the widespread incident of dental disease or whether uh, we will see the field maintain a system in which poor oral health services, um, poor oral health serves as a primary marker of social inequality uh, for most poor Americans. And then my last slide, which I just of course have to do my COVID addendum. <laughs> the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated a number of the policy changes that may reshape the future of dental care. Um, for example, we saw rapid changes to the way that we did licensure requirements and um, not using live patient exams, which is an absolutely barbaric practice that continues in my personal opinion. Um, and the field went back to doing something they've been trying to get rid of, even though they did get rid of it in the COVID pandemic. This is, it's literally an example of how resilient that current set of structures and systems are that really wants to just stay the same. Um, on the upside, telehealth, the telehealth modalities, that has um, really changed the field a lot. It's also accelerated practice consolidation, uh, which is gives the uh, status quo a lot of heartburn. Um, and as with most other fields um, within dental, there are widespread workforce shortages and a high level of burnout. So. Lots of challenges ahead, um, and I will stop there. Um, stop, uh, stop sharing my screen. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Mertz. What questions do we have um, in the room? Uh, 
Um, I have one. Um, at least in your experience, what do you think is like the thing that makes it most difficult for people who don't go to the dentist regularly to actually make that first initial step to like, you know, go to the dentist? Um, it's probably cost. Um, I think that that and trust, um, so kind of, uh, certainly not this current generation, but if, if your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents never went to the dentist and didn't have those, um, types of, um, cultural, um, the cultural regularity of that. Um, I think there's that to that issue, but, but I think the number one reason people report is cost. It's just really, really expensive, um, out of pocket for people. And, you know, I'll give you an example. Our pediatric dentists have two kids. Our pediatric dentist recently stopped taking our insurance and I work for a dental school. Like I, I can't even find someone to take the dental insurance anymore. I took my kids in for two exams. They each had an exam, a profi or cleaning, and only one of them had bite wing x-rays. I got charged $750 for that visit. And I was only reimbursed $250 from the insurance for it. So imagine you're on Medicaid. Imagine you are working at, you know, poverty, below poverty level. You're going to pay $750 to have your kids' teeth cleaned? No way not going to happen so it's it's i i think that's really the biggest um the biggest issue thank you um i'll do you want me to address the question in the chat uh, that's exactly what i was going to ask you to do okay yeah um yeah in rural areas uh that also uh Thank you for bringing that up. Um, just uh, even the availability of services and transportation and other things is also a known um, big barrier. Um, other countries integrating care more successfully. Um, no, and that's weird because there are definitely countries that have more integrated healthcare systems, or you could even look at something like the UK that has the National Health Service that does cover dental, but dentistry is still very isolated and, and it has its own billing models and it has its own reimbursement schemes and et cetera, even though they have this national health insurance um, plan. So it is, um, I have not seen areas where it's been fully integrated that way. Um, Germany, maybe they have a stomatology model, which is uh, where the dentists go to medical school and then they specialize in dentistry. Um, but I don't know much about the German delivery system, so I couldn't speak to it uh, beyond that. I, I'm not sure if I have to raise my hand. Go right ahead. Okay, uh, David Gage, I'm a, I have a private dental office. Uh, first with your, your comment about your kids, I'm sorry you had that experience. At my office, and I think most general dental offices, a couple kids getting x-rays exams would be like $125 each. So I can't say why that was so expensive. Um, well, but, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm going back there, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Yeah. Um, so my question for you would be, um, I have a buddy who's a PA, and he always tells me when people come in, probably a quarter of the time he's in the ER, he's seeing tooth infections. And it ends up costing the hospital via, you know, Medicaid reimbursements or, or making the hospital maybe $250 or $350, sometimes $500 just for him to numb somebody up, prescribe them antibiotics and say, you should go see your dentist. Yep. So what I don't understand is why Medicaid for dentists only reimburses like $37 for a limited exam where I would, you know, do the same thing, except then I could treat at the end instead of the PA you know, effectively charging 300 or 500 and not being able to treat. Yeah, no, I don't run Medicaid. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, but I do, it, it is, it, it stems, I believe, I mean, my understanding is that because EMTALA, the Emergency Medicine Access Act, which was essentially the guarantee that you can always get care in an emergency room so that the, because the hospitals were patient dumping and doing various things, that that part of that, um, the promise in, in mandating that was that then people would get paid um, for what the services that they were providing in those, although the hospitals write tons of it off anyway. Um, so, so yeah, but I just don't even think probably when that law was passed that, 
It's a great question, like whether anyone from the dental community was even in the room, even had, was even part of that conversation around emergency department use. Um, but the costs have been um, uh, articulated and uh, measured by many different researchers, and it's a huge amount of money. It's a huge amount of money. And it's for what you said. It's for a temporary palliative approach, not actual health. You're just getting, you're usually what you're usually getting a uh, painkiller and an antibiotic, and then you're out the door. Yeah. So, um, steps we can take regional level of anti-innovation. Well, I mean, you guys are doing some of the most innovative um, stuff around up there. I mean, I'll just call out to Dr. Hogan and the um, dental therapy work that you all are doing is, um, you know, it's, it's really incredible. Um, and so I'm just really, hi, Dr. Hogan. Uh, and I, you know, I think you just had, it really is around just continuing to, um, bring an equity lens and continuing to, um, unfortunately it's a political fight. Most of it is really a political fight. Um, but I think there's, there's been a lot of progress and, um, hopefully we'll see, we'll see more expansion now with the, um, additional programs being, um, accredited and, and moving forward. So. Okay. Well, we have one hand up and then, um, we'll, use that one as our last question in this moment, then we'll go to networking and then we have a bit more time for discussion. So go ahead, Kristen. Okay, question. And then last question, pressure's on. No, I was just curious. Um, it, it just seems to me like the integrating of dental um, into some of the medical pieces where at least the medical providers are looking in someone's mouth um, and doing a cursory exam, maybe applying fluoride, kind of similar to what our core is doing with like the medical dental integration. I mean, that and, and across all ages really would be huge. And I guess I would just love to see if you have any thoughts about how that could be better incorporated. I know that there's a billing component to that. There's a training piece to that to get medical providers um, much more comfortable um, in that realm. But I, I just feel like, you know, when, we, when you look at some of the data and the lack of access, particularly to dental care, at least for those who are able to access medical care, maybe there's a, um, a touch point that we could utilize to help to address some of those um, issues before they really, um, devolve into something quite, quite serious um, and infectious. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll leave it to Dr. Fisher Owens to address that question a little later, because I think that's probably more in her area, but I would, um, I would say that the scope of practice for physicians, they can do dentistry. I mean, it's technically in their scope of practice. They won't because then they wouldn't be able to get liability insurance. Um, but I did a presentation to uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics about dental therapy and what it was and how they work. And everyone in the room wanted to know how they could hire one. They're like, how can I get one of those folks in my practice, right? Well, the dental therapy laws say that the dental therapist has to be supervised by a dentist. So then, so the scope of practice laws are very, they're set up to continue to maintain the control and isolation. Having said that, um, I believe that the same way that they've um, really moved fluoride as something that could be done in a primary care or pediatric setting, um, that uh, silver diamine fluoride is moving that way as well. Um, and then that would actually allow you to go beyond prevention to doing um, you know, a stopgap um, uh, for uh, active decay for kids. It's also used widely in um, uh, long-term care uh, and um, for older adults who can't, um, uh, for whatever reason, um, uh, are unable to get restorative care. So yeah, but it's a great question. And I think hopefully that's that's what you all talk about for the rest of the day. Susan's, yes, yes, exactly. Okay, thank you, everyone. So we're going to spend a little bit of time just kind of processing together. We're just going to make it short. So we're going to go into some breakout rooms. Please use your camera so that you can look into each other's beautiful faces and share more openly. Um, 
and we want you to share who you are uh, with each other, but also what surprised you about what you heard Dr. Mertz share? Um, where have you seen this show up in your personal and professional lives or whatever other conversation you would like to have, because it's really just about getting to know each other. And then we'll come back together. So we'll do a short one um, since we had so many questions. So we'll just maybe four minutes, five minutes together, and then we'll come back. Conversation. Does anybody want to share something that like really stood out in their breakout group around what they heard? Um, I have a couple things. I'm Nicole from South County Fire. Hi, Nicole. Hi. I am going to say that I... I popped in just now before you went to the breakout group. So my group filled me in and it was the here. So I'm going to kind of give you what I think it was about the conversation of how like dentists are reimbursed, but there is that Medicaid or Medicare will reimburse a hospital like a thousand dollars. So I kind of want to pose a question. So there's two things that I've heard recently. One is there are some states that are starting to mandate that you have to find another option um, besides the ER and Colorado is one of them that has a mandate that they're starting. So I'd like to know if anybody knows about that. And secondly, I have a question. We want to defer people from the ER, but there's something, there's something about our ER doctors are somehow tied to the number of people that come in and they don't, they don't, they're, they're supportive of programs that help us find other alternatives like programs and stuff so we don't get to the ER. But there's something behind that. They don't always support us because when COVID decreased the numbers in the ER, the hospitals were losing money. So we're, we sit in this dual world. So we want to find them other alternatives so they don't take up beds and it doesn't cost a lot of money. But people like Medicaid, Medicare are so willing to pay that thousand dollars versus paying the dentist or someone for preventive care. And I'm really curious what's behind that. Okay, I'm done. That's some more stuff. I, I'll, I will just say that the um, protectionism that I talked about for dentistry, I mean, physicians have it too, you know, they're still fighting with nurse practitioners, you know, so it's, it, it, it's this like fiefdom, um, you know, and the, you see it through your view of what your current environment is, and it's like needing to take a step back. So that may be some of it. Um, and I think from the, the payment issue came up earlier, and I think, I think it's a different, it's, they're not paying it out of the same pot of money. And I think that's the thing. It's like the payment is for the emergency room visit, regardless of why you're there. And so they're not really paying for dental care. They're paying for the emergency visit care. And I think that's why um, it's seen as, as different. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Mertz. I know you are having to run off to your next engagement. Um, if people have additional questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I can always follow up with, um, with Beth. Um, thank you for your time today. Um, we are going to keep trucking along here and we have another wonderful uh presentation. And this time we're going to bring it into the local. So we have Dr. Dubeck, who is the dental director over at the Lummi Dental, Tribal Dental Clinic. And from the big, big worldview that we just had, she's going to bring us into our local kind of tangible um examples of how integration can uh impact a dental clinic and the healthcare um, system within uh, the tribe. Tri ah, 
Lummi Tribal uh, Clinics. So um, Dr. Dubeck is a native Washingtonian and soon after her uh, degree at the School of Dentistry in Milwaukee came right back and started out in private practice, but her heart really lay with public health. So she became the dental director over at Lummi Tribal Health Center. And she's been there for nine years and has passionately worked to improve how dentistry is delivered. Um, and she's had some great impacts over there. And that is seen through the increase in patient compliance. Um, she has served on the Lynn Steering Committee, so thank you, Dr. Dubeck, as well as the Indian Health Services Dental Director Committee. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Dubeck, and uh, take it away. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, today, I am going to present about our EPIC integration. Uh, for those who are not familiar with EPIC, we um, purchased a new software at the beginning of the year. Um, Epic is uh, a software that has encompassed, or Ocean has encompassed both medical and dental behavioral health. Um, it has been uh, a learning curve for sure the, since January, but it's been really great integrating all sides of health. And then. Is someone able to click the next, please? Thank you. Um, so for those who um, haven't heard of Epic, Epic um, is becoming a lot larger nationwide. Um, we are one of the few dental offices that have it. Um, it is wisdom is what we're currently using. And there have been some huge benefits of converting from our old software to our current software wisdom. Um, one of the big benefits with using wisdom is it allows us to provide a more coordinated care, a lot of good handoffs, either behavioral health, me um, medical, um, peds, and then um, it really allows us to just integrate all those departments as well as saying HIPAA compliant. Um, and there are a lot of patient interactions with this new software that we're utilizing that I'll talk about later. So um, one of the biggest ones are that have been beneficial to us are there are direct messaging. And so we have a secure chat to each department and then pools of departments. So we have a medical pool, nursing pool, provider pool, et cetera. And so we're really able to communicate fast and efficient using our direct messaging, either to in check coverage, uh, to work with CHR who transports our patients from time to time. Um, we have a patient with high VP, we're able to send a direct message to um, the doc on call um, for the day. And so with that direct instant messaging, we're able to essentially take care of that patient while that patient stays in that room. Um, some other nice features that uh, Wisdom and I should just say Epic, I'm just going to refer it to Epic. We have baskets and in baskets and we're able to link providers to our chart notes for second opinions, to have them review the chart. Um, so when I and finish seeing a patient, essentially what I'm able to do is link in either one of my colleagues to see if they're comfortable doing the next procedure or um, someone from the medical team um, to review their chart or to confirm any findings. Um, that has been very helpful in order to allow this integration to happen and making sure we're all on the same page when treating the patient. Um, other great features, the, med the medication lists, their problem lists, everything has been reconciled by both medical and dental. And so we're always looking at everything in live, in the live moment that has been checked off. Um, so we aren't having to be repetitive when that patient comes in, um, which has been really nice and the patients do enjoy that. So we have changed our medical history form to more of an intake form. 
um, and have streamlined that process. Um, the Care Everywhere access is really neat in a sense where if our patient does go to the hospital, because our hospital is using this software as well, we're able to get their ER reports, see what their ER report entailed. The chart notes are there. Um, every morning we have a medical meeting. And if there were anybody, if there were any patients who checked in um, to the ER for dental pain, we then get that report and then call that patient in. So we're able to take care of that patient and get all that information from the software. The Well app allows us to communicate with the patients, both texting them reminders, rescheduling. Um, they can send us messages as well. And then we have really been able to use the software for outreach. Um, that has been very nice. And I'll kind of explain that in the next slides. With appointments, it's really been beneficial when scheduling patients. All of their scheduled appointments are visible to both us and to any other department to ensure that we're not double booking a patient. That has been nice because prior to every department being on their own software, we did run into that from time to time. We also have CHR, which is a service that we provide for our patients for transportation, and we're able to schedule that within the system as well to ensure that patient is able to show up to their appointment. Um, so really making sure we're able to take care of all of the needs of the patient and each department working together and collaborating. Our referral system internally has been nice. In order to allow that collaboration, we have physical therapy here as well, and we have been referring our patients with any TMD um, to allow physical therapy, which we're trained to help with those with the disorder. Um, so sending an internal referral to physical therapy and allowing them to reach out to the patient and schedule. And then we work with them in order to help both them and the physical therapist determine what the needs are of that patient. Um, as I mentioned before, some of our kind of big things in dental is we do have patients that have some serious health concerns. And so when we do have patients with high BP, we're able to contact that doc on call um, or any other potential symptoms that we may need medical attention. Um, as I mentioned earlier, outreach programs, we are currently at quite a few outreach sites, um, both our Lummi Nation School, which is K through 12, our Head Start Teen Parent Center, WIC, um, and then a couple other sites. What we're able to do is we have our dental therapists and a dentist visit these sites. And then if our patients are needing referrals right then and there, we're able to process those referrals with the software. Um, and then incorporating that well app, as I explained before, um, really allows that communication with the patient. One of the big things that we're doing is this ensuring that we're not over prescribing narcotics. Uh, the one I would say one of the best features that I have really enjoyed um, versus going into PMP on a separate window and logging in, et cetera. Uh, this software automatically pops up that PMP report to ensure when the last time were prescribed narcotics, if they have been prescribed narcotics, and it gives all the information very clearly on it prior to allowing you to prescribe. So with that, it allows us to do our due diligence, um, to ensure we're doing the best thing for the patient. Um, and then I just put in a little blurb about another um, neat that thing that we are doing in our department is using platelet-rich fibrin and dental um, during our oral surgery appointments to decrease the use of narcotics by increasing healing time. And that is it. That sounds like a lot that you have been working on. <laughs> um, it's been a steep learning curve, uh, but nonetheless, 
you know, it is very medical based, but it really allows us to get the overall picture and ensure that we are taking care of the patient and the patient's needs. Thank you. Well, I want to turn it over to the room. Um, you, I think we already have a comment here. Tribal healthcare systems provide such amazing examples of how the broader healthcare system could work. So thank you to you, Dr. Dubeck. And I also hear you have a new, newly designed clinic opening this summer. Yes, we do. Yes. So hopefully we're moving in the next couple of months. Great. Yeah. So what questions do we have for Dr. Dubeck and their integration efforts? Hello, Dr. Dubeck. My name is Desiree Vivas. I work for CMAR Community Health Centers, and we also have EPIC. Um, I'm curious, we are doing some integration as well, but you guys seem to be way ahead of that. Um, we are also integrating between medical and dental for the front desk type of stuff, you know, the appointments and whatnot, and using the pools, a lot of the features that you're using. Um, how long have you had EPIC? When did you guys begin? We started in 2020, I want to say. Uh, yeah, we went live January of this year. Oh, January of this year. Yes. Holy moly. Okay. And then, so, um, you had mentioned you guys have therapists. So where are you located? I'm sorry. Cause I don't, we don't have therapists. That's only allowed in certain areas. Yet. Yeah. North <laughs> yeah. North Bellingham. So you're up there. Okay. Yep. Huh. All Close right. To Ah, okay. We're out yeah. there. I'd be curious to set some time afterwards to talk with you about some of the stuff that you are able to do just to see uh, where we may be able to improve on some of the integrations that we have. Like I said, we do integrate with medical, dental, behavioral health, um, outreach. We use the system for the outreach, uh, same with referral base and everything. I just wonder if you have some of the same challenges that we have had, especially for referrals, because we have so many departments using the referrals and then they have to fall into these work queues and then you got to follow up with those work queues and make sure that they go into the right buckets and all that kind of good stuff so yeah um something that I'd be interested in knowing a little bit more about yeah my email was on that last page um and then I'm happy to put it in the chat that would be perfect thank you thank you Desiree anyone else I'm curious, um, Dr. Dubeck, what sorts of training that you've had to add in for staff in sectors that maybe like they're maybe not as familiar with, like, have you had to increase training for staff in order to properly integrate between the departments? Yeah, we have required trainings. Um, when we all did it, we did it as a group. When we onboard new employees, we have a pretty systematic approach of how to onboard. Um, we have required videos and interactive kind of homework sessions that are required to even start playing in the software. Um, and then there is a um, kind of... No, I don't know what the correct word, but kind of just a, a not live section where you can kind of dabble and practice in. Um, and then we basically will have elbow to elbow support um, from a super user is what we call them here at our clinic is um, an epic super user. And so we will have elbow to elbow support for an additional week. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much. We really appreciate, I know you have to run back to the clinic right yeah, away. Yes. <laughs> well, if any other questions come through, I will definitely connect with you to get those answered. Appreciate your time. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Take care. All right, we're gonna take a quick three minute break just so people can run and get something to drink or go to the bathroom. Um, so feel free to just turn off your camera if you would like, we'll play a little bit of music, but we will come back at 1.39. So don't go too far, but um, wanna get you out of here on time. Um, so if you all can start to return, that would be great.
Um, all right. So we are halfway through our time together. And so I um, would like to introduce you all to Dr. Fisher Owens. Um, she is the Director for Pediatrics, Primary Care, and Public Health Integration for the San Francisco Health Network, and a Clinical Professor of Pediatrics in the UCSF School of Medicine, as well as a Clinical Professor of Preventative and Restorative Dental Services at UCFS School of Dentistry. She also practices at San Francisco General, which is the county public hospital and FQHC, and created a decade-old award-winning and sustainable oral health clinic embedded in the pediatric outpatient clinic. She works with physicians on preventing oral disease in children and is a champion of interprofessional team-based care and of centering supportive services in primary care to best meet patient needs. So welcome, Dr. Fisher Owens. Thank you very much. And I'm excited to be here with you today at bringing you the physician perspective or the medical perspective about this situation and acknowledging how important what you already know that oral health is central to optimal health. So talking about what can be done and hopefully leading that into discussion of what you can do about it. So I have to start with just some disclosures about uh, research support that I've gotten um, and to say that I don't have any financial relationships to disclose and this is not technically medical advice. So all small print aside, we will jump in. Oh, one more piece of small print. I do talk about fluoride varnish, which technically is only licensed for tooth sensitivity, not prevention. But I think everybody who works in the world of pediatrics knows that there's a lot we do that is off label but important, and so that's why we do it. So I've got some objectives, but instead of telling you what I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna jump right in and talk about how important this is in terms of pediatric care and overall systemic health. We'll start by saying, why me? Why am I here talking about oral health when I'm not a dentist? You all know much more about this than I do. Um, but I am here because Oh, that is not showing up. There we go. Um, I'm here because of my patients. I'm here because of a patient that I saw who had been discharged from the hospital after one week of being in the hospital. And this was a teaching hospital. So that means one week of multiple exams by medical students and nurses and residents and fellows and attendings, different shifts every day. And this patient who had been admitted with seizure activity was discharged because they couldn't figure out what was going wrong with her. And this poor young lady who had had seizures known before, but they checked her epileptic levels and they couldn't find anything with that. And they checked and they looked for um, activity of her in her brain. They looked at levels in her drugs, uh, drugs in her blood, and they couldn't find anything. And so finally they discharged her because they said, well, we're not doing anything. And I, doing my basic general pediatrician head to toe, found a whopping dental abscess in this young girl's mouth. She was not seizing. She was rigoring because of the pain that she was in. And I thought, how is it that all of these smart, you know, these brilliant minds saw this patient but missed her essential problem? And I said, yeah, why don't we do more with oral health? I asked myself and I looked into it and I said, why don't doctors do more with oral health? When we know about kids making visits to, the, to their providers, they will on average see a pediatrician or family practitioner 10 times for their regular visits in their first year. But they may not get to see the dentist until three, four, five years old. So they've already seen their primary care provider at around 10 times before they see the dentist. And so when I looked at that and I said, why, isn't, why aren't we doing more for these kids? Because we know by the time they're you know, in their toddler period, before they even start school, almost a quarter of kids already have dental caries. 
So we're missing a major opportunity at a prevention and about avoiding disease, which is what we do as pediatricians. So when we also think of it and say, well, maybe it's not that common, you know, and, and we hear from parents as well as from some of my colleagues. And, you know, I saw that comment from Sue Ridge and her colleagues, like, oh, we're already doing too much. I'll come back to that topic, by the way. But in fact, this is the most common chronic disease of childhood. And the graph on the top and the right shows the relative amount of caries as compared to asthma or hay fever or chronic bronchitis. Now, no pediatrician in their right mind would say, eh, asthma, it's not that common. I don't need to deal with it. And yet something that is five times more likely is something they're going to avoid. That doesn't make sense. We also have to think about what the impact is for the child. Um, first and central is the pain issue. We talked earlier about the cost of going to emergency room visits, and I'll actually come back with a comment on that. But upwards of 20% of non-essential visits to the emergency room are related to dental pain. So there's a major opportunity there in cost savings if we could work through those issues. The pain also leads to the issue of school loss. So and this is a number from uh, 2000. I'm sorry, I thought I'd updated this, but it's now um, upwards of this. It's actually continued to increase instead of decrease the millions of hours of school that are lost per year. And that's just the cost of children not sitting in the chair. That's not including all of the impact on kids of having stayed up late the night before because they were in the emergency room with their parent for their tooth pain. So they're not focusing when they're sitting in the classroom. But I, I'm not entirely sure about this for Washington, but here in California, schools are paid based on the attendance in the classroom. So if kids are missing school, that then becomes a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy where the kids are missing school, the school gets paid less, there's less opportunities in that school, and the kids who are having these problems, as we'll see in a second, are the ones who have the greatest need for more investment in those schools. And so it self-fulfills issues. We know that kids who have oral pain are more likely to drop out of school simply because of their teeth. And that has impact on them as children. It has impact on them as adults in terms of their job attainment. And it also has impact on them systemically. We know the greatest likelihood of poor outcome in adulthood on their teeth is if they've had caries in their primary teeth because the teeth may fall out, but the bacteria stays in the mouth and that trajectory of having problems can be multifold. This is because if we move on, at, by the end of life, nearly every American has had complications with his or her teeth. And I won't make, yourself, make you out yourselves if you're one of those people, but I have, I know it. Um, and that, but that for us, thankfully, most of us who are here, who are working in public health or the healthcare system have access to getting treated. For a lot of people, they don't. And we know that there are major implications for adults in terms of their systemic disease, the impact on heart and lung disease, the frequency of stroke, higher rates of low birth weight babies and premature babies, all of which cost more to the system and have higher likelihoods of developmental delays. And that's as well as diabetes. And so for just a few examples of this, if there is routine periodontal treatment, it decreases the cost of dental care for people with these diseases. So for instance, in adults with diabetes, routine periodontal treatment actually drops the cost of their dental care but even more interesting, it drops their overall medical care costs by over a quarter. So that's a major implication when you think about all of the costs for diabetes in the United States. We see similar trends with heart disease, dropping it by a quarter, with stroke, dropping medical care by over a third. And so these continue to have implications. So, uh, you know, I, I, it seems like every week I see there's a new article on dementia, there's a new article on end stage renal disease, a new article uh, about uh, prematurity, uh, you know, and even, art, even groups 
like the European Society of Cardiology, which maybe is not someone you'd think of as being a major oral health advocate, they have a major headline on their page, brush your teeth to protect your heart. Because they, we recognize, and more and more in the medical field, we're seeing the importance of us making sure our patients are getting appropriate care. A couple more, atrial fibrillation and heart failure. The list goes on and on. I, but because I want to get to the questions you asked earlier, I'm going to move through this next section a little quickly. What I'm showing you here um, is this data is not exactly precise, but I think the comparison is so valid that I wanted to share it with you. What you see in the center graph here is the dark lines represent children who are poor and the lighter bars represent children who are non-poor. Across the bottom, we see that this left group relates to younger kids, so those with primary dentition. The middle bar shows those with mixed dentition, and the right bars shows those with adult teeth. And in every case, you see a major difference between those who are poor and non-poor, and this is in terms of the rate of untreated decayed teeth. So, you know, what we already know is it's bad to be poor in America, but this is just shown out in oral health. Similarly, on the next slide, we take that same comparison, poor and non-poor, and on the left chart, we're showing it for the younger kids, on the right chart for the older kids. But now I'm breaking it out by non-Hispanic Black on the left, Mexican American in the middle, and non-Hispanic White on the right. And you can see here again these gaps, but that even exists across the different racial ethnic differences where it is essentially better, and I say that in relative terms, better to be a poor white person than a non-poor black person in terms of the rate of disease. And you can see that even more so with the older kids. Uh, so this is the more recent data that I have there, um, but I, I felt like the bars didn't quite paint the picture as well as those earlier set did. You know, being with where you work, that this is also an issue in the rural versus urban exposures. So there's disparities in access where those who are in rural areas have more access to fluoridated water. They have more access to dentists. And even for those who have the access, they still have more visits if you're in an urban area than in a rural area. So there's a real disparity by geography as well. And I'll show you one example from my hometown. For those of you who know San Francisco, there are areas in San Francisco, even our little microcosm, that have areas where the rates are two to three times higher than in other areas of the city. And if you know San Francisco at all, these areas almost, identi almost are identical to redlining in, the, in San Francisco. So this is where those structural, and you know, we talked about structural, or it, there was a question about structural inequities before. You're, I can see it with the numbers in my own city. So as a, I care about these things, I also care about doing a good job. And I know you do too. That's why you're here. Um, the Pew Report actually gave Washington a pretty good grade of, of a B, although most of us wouldn't accept Bs as our grades, but for the Pew Report they did, they said that 35 of 39 counties in Washington do not have enough dentists. And one of the interesting things is that even when the kids' dentist uh, services aren't cut, if there are cuts in adults' care, it decreases the rate of kids going to the dentist. And there was a question about this before, about um, why don't people go? And one of the reasons that I'll talk about as well is dental anxiety. And so if the parents have had a bad experience, they're more nervous about going to the dentist and that is transmitted to the child. Um, it just like a fear of dogs is tra transmitted to a child who's never been bitten by a dog. Now, on the positive side, another great thing you've got um, is the dental therapist in, D in Washington. So that's something that helps. Um, but these are, these are pieces we care about. A few more reasons I hope you can care. 
and I will say I was I was sad to see that there weren't more medical providers on this, um, but I hope that some of these points that I'm making are points that you can take to your local dent your local medical people to say how can you these are why you should care, um, and I think for instance that big one when the when the when um, who was it when Sue Ridge said that doctors already say they're doing too much, okay. I, I agree. I'm still in my scrubs because I didn't have time to change from my clinic this morning to coming here to talk to you. I feel busy too. But if I'm not dealing with the most common chronic problem in my patients, why am I even there? Um, we know in medicine that the best return on investment in time is vaccines, 100%. But number two is investing in oral health. So if we don't do that as medical providers, what are we doing at all? We try to prevent diabetes we, by diet counseling. We try to prevent obesity with breastfeeding. We try to prevent diseases with vaccines. We can prevent the most common chronic problem. And in fact, that's something that our national policy says we should do. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Dental, Dent, Pediatric Dentistry, the American Academy of Family Practitioners, all say children should see a dentist by age one or six months after the eruption of the first tooth, whichever comes first. So we know that this is, this is our guidelines in what we should be doing. And it's also a guidelines from the United States Preventive Services Task Force. So the USPSTF is important in medical care because when it says something should be done, it actually means that insurance should cover it. So it, it kind of is the imprimatur of saying the research has been done and this is important. And for years, they've said that medical providers should support fluoride supplements if, they're, if children are non-fluoride exposed. But also now for several years, they've said that fluoride varnish should be applied in the medical office. Um, I will note, if any of you have seen this, they don't recommend for or against doing routine oral exams because there's no data to indicate one way or the other. Although in Washington, it's something that is supported and so uh, with through Mouth Matters and Acora. So I will encourage you to be thinking of that. And I will move to an example. One more reason why you should care is because of patients like this. And if we were in the room together, I'd ask if any of you know who it is. I see a couple nods. You know this is Diamante Driver, who is a young man who had the misfortune of being born poor. He was miles outside of Washington, D.C., miles away from fantastic dental care. And it took his mom over eight months to get him seen, um, to get, and actually she was trying to get his brother seen because his brother had oral pain. He didn't even have pain because his tooth was already dead. But after months of waiting, emergency brain surgery, two weeks in the hospital, six weeks in rehab, more than a quarter million dollars of cost, and he still succumbed to a completely preventable disease. So this was Diamante after his first brain surgery. So I look at that and I say, we, we are providers, we are public health professionals, we are child advocates, we are preventionists. This is what we're here to do is prevent this kind of problem. And I want, I know I've just given you a whole lot of negative news. So I want to move to one slide of hope and then I'll come with some more examples. And this slide of hope, um, which again is from here in San Francisco, but you can see on the left side how the rate of decay throughout the city was actually fairly high and that only about six years later, or five year span later, the rates had improved everywhere. Um, and that was because of a coalition that we started and have been working on, and I'll tell you about today. But it's a coalition like yours. It's a coalition of childcare workers and educators and medical and dental training programs and met schools and therapists and community health workers and all kinds of people coming together. I'll actually show you a slide of our collective in a minute. But first, I'll just remind you that caries, early childhood caries, is an infectious disease and it's a transmissible dis disease. So it can be 
transmitted from child to child. It can be transmitted just like this cutie pie who's got her hand in mom's mouth and then it's gonna stick it in her. She can transmit that disease to, to, herself, to herself. And so I, I sometimes wish we called it strep tooth instead of early childhood caries. Cause I think people don't know what early childhood caries are but you hear strep and like parents are on the telephone. They're calling the pediatrician. I don't want my kid to have strep but it's in their mouth. And so there's things we can do so that it's not starting because if it colonizes early with the eruption of teeth, then this is what the teeth look like later. Now the process in cartoon form is that germs consume sugar and that's simple carbohydrates in the mouth. And then that turns to acid and the acid causes decay. So here's a healthy tooth. This is what we wanna see. But if that acid forms and the decay starts, you start to get these little eruptions, er erosions that get bigger and bigger and bigger. But the good news is this is a preventable and a reversible process. So when the bacteria is in the mouth, we can actually give guidance, and it could be called an anticipatory guidance, about their saliva habits. And that can block right here, it can block the transmission of disease. If there, if the bacteria though is there and it meets with different sugars, that can lead on to tooth decay. But we can block it again by helping give them guidance about not having frequent snacks and not drinking juice during the day and different pieces like this. And then third, if there is the acid that's dissolving the tooth mineral, fluoride can either prevent that or stop that. So I'm gonna spend the next section of my talk talking about the role fluoride can have. Um, I really felt strongly about prevention, so I put it twice. So when we talk about fluoride, um, part of this step for you as, as pro your providers or for your systems, you start by getting educated. That's what you're doing today. I'll also remind you, you are so lucky in Washington to have access to Mouth Matters, which is a pr training program run by our CORA and, and headed by our wonderful Madeline Kaplow, who's on the call today, that this helps train, work with medical oral health integration in the different areas of Washington. There also are online access um, for trainings for people. But for the purpose of moving into it, let's get to... Um, the first step in a medical office is always asking a ton of questions. And they're basically getting to this point, which is the balance of what are the pathologic factors or the bad factors and what are the protective factors. And the more we have protective factors that moves our balance to the no carry side, and the more that there are risks or pathologic fa factors, it goes to the pathologic side. And I'm sure uh, that the doctor who says they're doing too much says, I can't ask any more questions. And I will remind you that while we could look, and I took out a bunch of slides about this, but there are a ton of questions that could be asked about the, the mouth, but actually most of them are already getting asked in other environments or other ways in the clinic. So people are doing an oral health assessment, they're just not thinking about it. Uh, but here's two examples of assessments if they'd like to see them. I'll then say one other thing we ask about are the social determinants of health. And this is definitely something that's gotten more uh, commonly in included in medical care. Healthy People 2030 defines this as the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes. And I'll underscore, it's why it's important that you're here. You know, less than 20% of health actually comes from what happens in the medical and dental office. The majority of health comes from where you are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, eat, and exercise. Those are all important factors. And so those social determinants of health are also important for what happens in care in the office. And these are, these are these questions that are included in EPIC. They're included in um, different, like the ACEs approach to things. But I'll call out a couple of them specifically. One is food security. And so someone might say, well, working at a food bank, what do I have to do with oral health? 
Well, first of all, food working in a food bank means you're working with people who have food security issues. And we know that that's associated with untreated caries. Um, we also know that with improvements in food, um, that that can actually reduce. So we went from having a higher rate of food insecurity to a lower rate of food security. Unfortunately, this was a 2020 just before the pandemic. So it didn't fully you know, capture a lot of the impact that our families had with the pandemic. Um, but it shows that there's a connection and it shows that there is a very easy or it leads us to the fact that there's a very easy tool that can be used in the medical or dental or other offices about food security. And asking these two questions is very sensitive as a way to elicit this issue and to figure out a way you can help patients. It's also something where if you're working in a, a food bank, you could think about, well, maybe if this is a major issue for my patients, we put, or my, my clients, we put a toothpaste and a toothbrush in with our, our food pantry box that we're giving patients so that, because if they can't afford food, they're probably not going to invest in a toothbrush, but it's an important piece to go together with the care you're giving. Now, getting back to my medical providers, one of the things they do is they look and they feel, that's their oral exam or what we call the objective part of our visits. And we wanna see healthy, happy teeth like this. Um, we wanna encourage parents to lift the lip because often the line of cavities is forming, like I don't know if you can see on this middle picture on the bottom how there's sort of a white rim right along the gum line. That's early cavities, reversible, but early cavities. So getting people to learn how to look and then using that as a teaching tool for why they're brushing and their, their diet is so, and their, their liquids particularly are so important. And it, we move into that because what do we do about it then? I said I'd get to fluoride and now it's the time. When I said that the tooth has some film on it and it causes some acid and then the acid erodes into the tooth, Hopefully not, hopefully you stop it. And if we can get it at this point, and I don't know if you're seeing, I don't think you're seeing my pointer as I'm moving, actually. I realize I'm pointing a lot and not, I don't think it's showing. We can see it. Oh, you can, okay, good. Um, that, that you can actually not only reverse the process, you can stop the process rather, but you can actually reverse it. And that's through fluoride. Now, fluoride works in four ways. It doesn't kill bacteria, but it stops them by making the tooth stronger and remineralizing the tooth, by slowing or reversing the demineralization or the weakening of the tooth. It actually inhibits the bacteria that are there, those, those germs that are eating the sugars, and it decreases the amount that the enamel is soluble. Now, it works through saliva and through plaque. And even though plaque is not good in the dental world, the, the fluoride can, can concentrate in that. So a lot of the effect of fluoride is topical, even if you're giving it systemically. So what I mean by that is even when you're having people drink tap water that's fluoridated, they're still getting the topical effect of the, of the fluoride going over their teeth and the fluoride concentrating in the plaque. Fluoride comes in many sources. I like to remind people it is a natural product. It is naturally in minerals, uh, in rocks. It naturally dissolves in water, but community water fluoridation is just about adjusting that level. It's naturally in tea, it's naturally in seafood. Um, but as I said, it, it, is, it can be in community fluoridated water. Um, only about three quarters of the US have access to it. And I stress the word access there because I know for many of my patients who all have access to fluoridated water, many of them come from areas of the world where tap water wasn't safe. So they're actually going out to the store and buying bottled water because they think it's helping them. They think it's helping their patient, their kids, um, when in fact they're spending extra money and it doesn't have access to the fluoride that is needed to help them. Of course, fluoride is in toothpaste and a couple other things like varnish, which we'll get to in a minute. So moving on, um, I mentioned this about the access, but that 
Fluoridation prevents at least a quarter of the tooth decay in the US. Um, it also saves money for every dollar invested. So for those of you who are uh, interested more in policy, this is really something, it's, it's a, it can be a struggle, but it is an important way to help support people in the community who can't afford to pay for it. Uh, because it is shown to be safe. And that's in contrast, actually, to community water. So people talk about fears about fluoridated water, but they don't really think about the fears of non-fluoridated or non-surveyed um, you know, water. So what you see here are these four bars, the one with the highest problems. This is, this is on the scale of violations per water system. The highest risks of problems with water is in rural low-income areas. Next, rural high-income, suburban, and urban. So community water isn't always that safe. And that is a reason people turn to bottled water. And I want to point out that we look at this explosion over the last 20 years of bottled water. But bottled water is not all the same. And it ranges from having too high of a level of fluoride to some that have you know, don't have any fluoride or almost no fluoride at all, to some that are actually bottled from municipal water sources. So it's community fluoride that's then bottled up and more expensive, um, upwards of a thousand times more expensive than getting water from the tap. And what's interesting when we think about this in terms of disparities is this chart. I'm gonna take a second on this one. Um, because I want, it shows on the left bar, it's non-Latino whites, in the middle is African-American and the right bar is Latino. The top are those that only drink tap water and the bottom are those that drink mo only bottled water. And then the gradations is for mostly bottled or mostly tap. And what we see here, comparing to the slides we discussed earlier about the increased risks uh, in patients who are African-American and Latino, that they also are more likely to drink only bottled water. So the patients who would have the most benefit aren't getting it. This is a matter that if you're in an area with fluoridated water, this is a message that can be given out from the food banks, that can be given out from um, different public health programs about supporting our families drinking fluoridated water. But another piece of it does come from the medical environment, my home, um, where I have been doing fluoride varnish in our clinic over the last uh, more than a dozen years now. Um, it is a concentrated resin. It sits in the mouth. It is easy to apply. I had about uh, 20 slides in my talk about how to apply it. And I realized that doing it in my office is less than a minute. And so me spending all this time talking about it would just fear, scare you that it takes too long. But it really is easy to integrate in. Uh, my nurses now end up doing it because they enjoy it. They do it while the patients are waiting. So it doesn't cause extra time in my clinic. And it very easily integrates into my workflow. Uh, for you all in Washington, you're particularly fortunate that Mouth Matters through Apple Health will pay for this application. And so it's something that supports the medical environment doing the right thing for the patient and helping prevent the disease that otherwise is showing up in the emergency room, showing up in the OR needing care. Because it is easy to apply. It can be done the knee to knee position the, um, like this. If, if they cry, it just gives them a good open mouth. Um, it can be done on the exam table. It can be done sitting up, even in a conference room. You can do fluoride varnish just about anywhere. And I'll say that I've actually worked with clinics that are doing it in their WIC offices. I worked with clinics that, or systems that do it with their early Head Start or their Head Start off, um, sites so that they're getting kids where they are, where they live, work, and play so that we can help prevent this disease. It can get up to two thirds of a disease reduction with this intervention, and it is not hard to work into the workflow. So we'll close up fluoride with a, even the dogs can get their teeth brushed. So it's, there are many good things, um, but I'll take for a second. Doctors like to talk a lot. So we like to do counseling. I know many of you, if you're doing SNAP, if you're doing WIC, you're doing public health people do lots of counseling. 
And I'll just remind you that the same kids that look like this or this that are sitting so close to the TV, they could touch it. They're the ones who open up and have mouths like this. So the counseling is actually very similar to obesity counseling. And in fact, I say you double your value with counseling if you say, not only will this help with your, with your weight, but it can also help keep your teeth healthy. And for many families, they don't even, they can't even conceive of having the self-efficacy of saying, I can help prevent problems. Like they just sort of accept it as, a, as it's going to be that they will have problems with their teeth. And so giving them the power to control it and prevent it in their kids can be very helpful. That can start with as young as infants, encouraging families to wipe their gums so the kids get used to having their gums wiped before they learn to resist like all one-year-olds do. And it can also go into counseling. Um, I'll come to another couple of counseling things in a minute, but first I wanna just mention, it also comes with referring. As Beth said, we medical providers don't want to be dentists. We want to get kids into their dental home and that you're very fortunate with Mouth Matters that you've got the Dentist Link website where you can go and search for a dentist near you that will take your child's insurance. And so you can make connections through here. And again, Mouth, Mouth Matters will sponsor uh, paying the providers who have been trained in this process to do these referrals. Now, I want to talk about some a, a few system-specific changes that can be made, some foundational work that I think needs to be made in a local, you know, in a LIN like yours. The first actually is establishing data to be collected, because the mere fact of collecting data will get people to look at this data and think, oh, gosh, you know, I thought we were doing better than this. Um, you know, I didn't realize this was such a bad problem for my kids. And that data can be a really instructive tool. Then you need to nurture a collaborative. You need to find a way to get people to work together and support their work. Um, I found with most of the systems that have been successful, they use case management and have been very successful with that to get patients in. Um, in my, my own system, we use case management, and we had such a high rate of success of patients making it to an appointment, you know, attending the appointment and doing the follow-up, that the dentist actually would allow us to schedule more patients with them if they knew they came through our project, because they knew that they would get there because of the case management. And then supporting a QA, QI, you know, quality assurance, performance improvement, lean, whatever um, acronym you like or whatever tool you like, but this, this improvement mindset to help make changes. So I mentioned our collaborative. It's the Cavity Free SF is what we call it. Um, you'll see it's like your group that we've got medical school and dental school. We've got the health networks or insurers. We've got the Department of Public Health, but also know we've got the school system, the, the medical and dental societies, Head Start. We've got a tribal organization. We've got local task forces um, in our Chinatown, our, our Mission neighborhood, which is a largely Hispanic neighborhood, and our Bayview Hunters Point, which is largely African-American. Um, so we've got, a, a, you know, a pit, it's a big table to get all those voices at the table, but it really allows us to take pieces and move forward. Because what we're doing is we're trying to meet the patient's needs. This can happen in a number of ways. It can happen, of course, in the doctor's office. And one point that was mentioned, um, done a lot in, you know, really being led in Colorado, but in other places around the country also, is embedding a hygienist in the medical practice or embedding a therapist in the practice. Um, you can also have these people serve as home visitors. Or it's huge. I, I saw one of our attendees today is with a CHW training, uh, having promotoras or CHWs trained with oral health tools also will allow them to help promote this message. Uh, I mentioned the food pharmacy, and actually I mentioned this one, so I'll keep going. Um, one project I really like is one called Reach Out and Read, which um, 
it's called Brushbook Bed. It relates to a project called Reach Out and Read. And particularly for any of you on this system who are foundations that are interested in literacy, literacy projects, it's a great way to bundle improving literacy and brushing teeth. And what we found with this initiative was that you can find more information about online, it's all free, is that parents liked it because it was the one time they were taught how to put their kid to sleep. And so they learned a lot from that process. A couple other innovations. Um, we use medical behavioral integration in my clinic. This is another one of our integrations. Um, you know, this morning I saw several new moms who were having some postpartum depression issues. And so having someone right there to help serve them was key. And I'm thrilled across the bay, uh, Dr. Huang Lei, who's an associate of mine, uh, working at Asian Health Services, she actually took that idea and integrated behavioral health into the dental environment and said, you know, our patients come in, they spend a lot of time with us, and especially if they're coming back again and again for services, this is a way for them to have contact with someone. Um, and she tells a really poignant story about a patient who was actually contemplating suicide, but because of the services in the dental office, now is working with them to help support their work because of the value of it. During COVID, we saw innovations, like was mentioned before, like doing drive-throughs. So you had drive-through vaccines, you could do drive-through varnish at that same time, or using telehealth. And telehealth is a great way to expand access when you don't have the room in your office. So teaching toothbrushing techniques, or um, one system even did the fluoride varnish through the telehealth. Um, so it's a way to, to find parents where they are and support them in that work. Another one is um, we've had success with is teaching brushing in Head Starts and early Head Starts. So the kids line up after their lunch and they all brush their teeth. And so um, we're getting those messages and those habits formed young. So I'm almost done here. I'm gonna talk uh, just briefly. Our goal is to have cavity-free children, which means cavity-free adults. And so that involves a number of organizations like you have here with training and with your services. And so can you say, how can you measure what you're doing? How well are you doing it? And is it helping? With that, I'll also point you to a reference with NOAA, which is a national network for oral health access. They talk about looking at your organization and do they have dental services or not? And if they don't, what kinds of things could you do or how could you expand? I, I loved hearing about school-based clinics because that's a great way to get kids. Um, you know, And sometimes it may be a mobile unit, including there was a question about uh, the emergency room and the mobile unit. Uh, we know that that will be cost saving, um, but I can see I'm getting lots of questions. So I'm gonna do just a few more slides. I'll say that there are real benefits to this work. There is the personal outcomes improving kids' health as well as school. The patients are satisfied because they're happy to have their care needs met. And interestingly, my nurses love this. My staff loves doing this. They say, I feel like I'm doing something good. And of course they're doing something good all the time, but it's really nice to have this concrete way they're helping. I mentioned the increased attendance at visits. It has decreased dental anxiety for our families and overall improved health, which I don't have time to talk about, but it's some kind of fun research. So I look at this, it's not just triple aim, or, it's quadruple or maybe quintuple aim because of all of the benefits. I think it's tied to advocacy, but I won't talk about that now, except to mention one piece I did, uh, worked on one of the National Academy studies Beth mentioned is implementing high quality primary care. This actually talks about oral health integration into the primary care. It talks about behavioral health and says, these are all tools that we need to help support it. When you, there, if someone asks me the question about uh, cost, I would like to talk about that too. But I think for now, I'll just say my objectives were to talk about this importance, how to integrate it, different ways to use it, ways to find resources, and ways to be patient-centered to promote this. I hope you feel like we've gotten there. And with that, I'll say this is not the end. You have your support in Lisa and the team when, with um, North 
oh, I changed at the beginning, but not here. North Sound, ACH, uh, with Mouth Matters and with each other, because you together as a collaborative can make these changes for your patients. You can prevent disease, you are preventionists, and we hope to make it as cool as Beyonce. Like if she and Blue Ivy can be flossing together, you know, what, what better role models do we have? So with that, I have my name if you have questions. And I will say thank you. And I will open up the chat to get to these questions. Um, oh, dear. <laughs> Okay, yes, I'll get you a copy of my slides. Um, I'm just, I have some extras at the end that I'm gonna cut out. So I will take those out. Let me stop this. Um, where'd they go? Um, preventistry, love that. Yeah, I'm actually working with uh, teaching some dental public health preventionists. So that's great. Um, Madeline put in about mouth matters and the link to the dental care. Access to fluoride in Washington. Um, when, with your question, Daisy, are you seeing access for community fluoride, water fluoridation or are you seeing fluoride varnish? Can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Okay, thank you. Um, fluoride varnish, you mentioned that that can be um, trained. I am a CHW for Allen County Public Health and I, I think that's amazing that if we, if I'm trained, we have ABCD program. I think Megan works. She is the nurse that who's runs the program and we work closely. And definitely I would love to have that here because um, living in an island, <laughs> yeah. we have a lot of community um, wells. And I think just what Harbor has, um, fluorine in the, in the water. In the rest of the island, we have another three more towns that I'm not sure they have that, but uh, uh, um, that, oh, can you hear me now? Okay, see me. And I think we could do that. If I'm trained, I could help that because I am as a live example of what you mentioned about how a doctor check on my oral health to solve an ear issue. Yeah. Yeah. So, and he, he said you, you, all your ear problems starts here in your mouth. So, oh, when I was 39 years old, I got my braces, <laughs> fixed alignment, never again, 25 years without having an ear problem. So I feel so identified what you were saying because I am one of those patients. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, so glad you're here. So glad you will help others around you and you know share that and grow. So thank you for that. Thank you. So how can I get this for my community? Uh, so I think um, get in touch with Madeline okay. um, or with Lisa. And, and I should not an or and um, and talk about it because there are ways you there are different ways to do it. There's it's actually very it, it is a reasonable uh, item. Um, it costs less than a dollar to actually do the application. So for some systems, they do it through the medical systems. Then you can build through Mouth Matters. Some um, some of the programs with which I work just say the cost is so little for the return that it's worth it for our investment. So there are different ways to do it, uh, and they can help you with finding some of those options that are good for you on your island. Okay, thank you so much. Thank My you. Pleasure. Other questions? I have a question um, rather than typing it in. Yes, please. I'm assuming that the varnish can only be applied by a dentist or a hygienist or an assistant, like a nurse probably couldn't do this. Um, so the answer is no, but, um, so for instance, I have had, I have had doctors when I've been trying to teach them to do fluoride varnish, they said, oh, I, I can't do that. I don't, I don't, can't do that. And I say, you do circumcisions and that is a lot more complicated than doing varnish. Um, and I actually, at the time my, I had a daughter who was five and I trained her to apply fluoride varnish. Um, and I, so I now tell people, if you have the motor skills of a five-year-old, you can do this. 
Uh, so anyone can do it. We can train anyone to do it. Um, so I've I've trained health workers. I've trained WIC workers. I've trained nurses. I've trained um, uh, I've trained all kinds of people to do it. The only difference is billing. So for billing, mm -hmm. it, it, it depends on the state, whether it, it can either be done by a doctor or a nurse under the doctor's orders um, or a dentist or a dental hygienist, but the actual doing of it is not complicated and um, doesn't take an extraordinary amount of, of effort or training. Um, and there's no law precluding that. Well, so I am I am not going to answer that for Washington because I am not an expert in Washington, but I think Madeline or Lisa can probably answer that for Washington. Madeline, if you're there and can answer, please do so. Well, Lisa, it's Lynette. So I, I am a nurse. I'm a school nurse. Um, and in Washington state, we would have to have uh, physicians orders because we don't have standing orders in schools. We have to have an order for each child. We can accept, you know, if there was a standing order, but without a physician's order, we couldn't, um, and written per permission by parent couldn't do it. Yeah, so there'd have to be an overseeing physician um, yes. to be part of it. Who was trained, well, to do the, the three services who was trained by Mouth Matters, by us at our Cora Foundation. So Madeline, I support Mouth Matters, and but I want to just challenge and say that's to be able to bill it. But I think the Correct. question is, could they do it in another venue without billing it? Correct. Right, right. If they weren't billing it, then that's a different situation. Yeah. Hey, are there other questions for Dr. Fisher Owens that people have? Please just come off mute. I'm going to give someone five seconds to come off mute and just say with the question that was asked before about costs, this is something that actually Dr. Mertz and I are working on with some grant work to try to figure out. Um, and a lot of the problem is that the prevention is paid for out of one pocket and the benefit is paid to another. And so that's part of why there's been a challenge. Um, locally, I've actually been able to convince Kaiser in our area to do prevention in clinic because they were seeing, because I gave them the costs of general anesthesia that they were paying for and said, if you, you can avoid these costs by investing in prevention. And so they've started to do it. I think that the fact that they're doing it will help lead others to do it as well. Um, but I think mo the more that people say are in one insurance one year and another insurance the next year, they people, the insurers may look at that and say, well, we don't reap the benefits. But I think you know, the more we look at overall costs to the system and supporting it, which is something we did with this National Academies report, we said, this is worth the investment. Okay, so we are going to do our next session, which is a little bit of networking. And I think it will give us the opportunity to process a bit and then we'll come back together um, and it might elicit some other questions for Dr. Fisher Owens. We'll make it nice and simple if we are gonna break out into groups of about five. Um, the questions that I would love for you all to contemplate are what opportunities do you see uh, to incorporate oral health care into your organization's existing programs and services? On the flip side, what are the barriers to implementing these strategies? And what technology or tools, education or knowledge or systems slash authority are needed to move towards integration? So come together, take come off your cameras, um, have a little conversation. We'll put you out there for maybe in the interest of time, and I know this late afternoon, we'll do 12 minutes um, and then we'll come back together. We do have a document. If someone could take notes, the document is um, labeled by breakout room, but really just pick a place, 
ask somebody to take notes, um, and then we'll share out a little bit when we come back. Let's talk about what we discussed in our groups. Does anybody want to share um, what came up in their group around some opportunities to integrate? Go ahead, Leslie. We um, kind of, I think, got a little off topic, but I got um, I got shut down before. I just wanted to, I had, I was in the room with Daisy and Amanda and Dr. Yoon, and um, Daisy was talking about um, uh, maybe uh, um, allowing so much time out of out of her schedule, um, like maybe four hours a week out of her schedule to apply fluoride varnish. And I was just starting to tell her that we do that in our preschool program and maybe to save her time. I don't know how, how it would look in a clinic if they have to see one child at a time, like pull back a child um, and apply varnish, pull back a child and apply varnish, but maybe in her clinic to save her time and allow them, allow her to be able to do that. They could do it in a, in like a, like we do in a preschool setting where they all come maybe three or four at a time, come in, apply varnish, apply varnish, apply varnish so that she doesn't, in case she, she doesn't, um, she hasn't, she hasn't asked yet for that amount of time out of her schedule, but in case she gets any, um, any feedback that, no, we don't want to allow this much time out of your schedule, four hours a, a week or whatever, it would, it would save her time depending on how many um, patients she's going to see. You could, cause we, it takes maybe three minutes to, to see a kiddo and look in their mouth and apply varnish. So, if you could put them, set them up in a line rather than one at a time, it would save her, save her time. Sorry, I ramble. <laughs> That's okay. Anybody else? What kind of opportunities do you see within your organization or the barriers to being able to better integrate oral health into the work that you're doing? Uh, at least from my organization, and this might not be answering the uh, question correctly, is um, the biggest uh, difficulty we have is just getting access to dentists. Um, because most dentists around here they either don't take Apple, or if they do take Apple, they have like a wait list of a year, or sometimes longer. Um, so yeah, at least from my organization, it's just convincing clients to like go to a dentist after 18 years and then telling them, yeah, it's going to be like six months until you actually can go to the dentist. Sandeep, what organization do you work for? Oh, uh, Opportunity Council up in uh, Bellingham. Oh, okay. Yeah. So maybe the, another way to think about it is like, what could Opportunity Council, it, Council do to increase oral health education um, with your clients? So you might not be able to affect the wait times at a dentist, but where are opportunities to educate parents or children that you might work with around, um, and Dr. Um, Fisher Owens, you can take it from here. This is a com uh, community action agency that has all kinds of services, energy assistance, housing assistance, um, employment, early childhood education. Where do you see opportunities for an organization like Opportunity Council? Well, we have the pleasure of working with uh, community task forces. So I, I think of that as a similar group. And some of it's it's very interesting to see how they've chosen different routes to track. Some are focused more on education. Some are focused. Uh, so one does a really big health. Um, uh, uh, Oh, I'm totally blanking on the word, but like a, a health fair. Um, and so they, they do a health fair in the fall and they've got flu vaccines and they'll do varnish and they'll do different prevention pieces. Um, but the, and, and some are more in, like one really was focused on community messaging around tap water. Um, Cause again, we are in a, a fluoridated area. Um, so different, it, and that's one of the beauties of community work is that you can't really tell them what to do, but encourage them to see what speaks to their community about this issue. Uh, but I think hearing that it's uh, such an egregious wait for to get into a dentist, it's all the more important that you do prevention. 
um, because you know, finding different ways and multiple ways of doing prevention is what you have to do to stem the tide until that point that they can get into a dentist. Now, the only other piece that might work depending on you know, with the outreach that you do is if you had the ability to do case management uh, that might be able to convince some of your dentists to see patients sooner if you could guarantee them the, the seat and chair. Because the most expensive thing for, for a provider is to have someone no-show. And so ways that you can help minimize that will can help encourage them to provide routine care. And so it's, um, I am... I, I, I'm not talking about having a give kids a smile once a year, um, you know, health fair kind of a thing. I, I, you want routine care for your patients. Awesome. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for cleaning up my confusion. So just kind of like impress upon them the importance of like all the preventative measures. Right, okay. right. Awesome. And Thank it's you. and so it could be about about not sharing spoons or not, you know, I, some communities we talk about not pre-chewing food because of the spread from the parent to the child's in the saliva. Uh, in some communities, it's about um, breastfeeding messaging and some it's about fluoride and some about brushing. And, and so there's different messages to different communities, um, but there are ways to maximize their prevention until they can get in. And um, Sandeep, I just want you to know that you have a perfect, um, resource right within Opportunity Council as the Whatcom ABCD coordinator sits within your organization. So uh, Rochelle is her name, and I think reaching out to her would be a great first step. Yeah, thank you. Will do. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else have any integration thoughts? Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Quiet group. Um, I will share something, and I don't know if you have a comment on this, Dr. Fisher Owens, but um, through Arlen, we fund several access to care um, projects with Medical Teams International, and over there, and they, their model is really about like emergency care, um, emergency dental care. Um, I know they do more than that, but our projects and we've been trying to add hygienists. So in the second chair um, for prevention, but what we're finding is that it is often really hard to fill the prevention side of those of the bus. Um, and we often have a wait list for emergency dental, and then it's really hard to convince people to, um, to take up, you know, that seat with the hygienist. And I'm wondering, I mean, that just makes me wonder about like the psychology behind having a lifetime of not really having access to oral health care and you know does it just become like this like emergency thought in your mind and how if you have any ideas I know this might be a little bit outside of what you do but have you come across this have you had any successes in kind of elevating prevention and really kind of turning the tide in oral health from just like this emergency service to more of a preventative focus? Uh, yes, so I, I it, it's interesting. I've, I've had a little bit of a different experience because normally when people come to my office, they've got three or four kids in tow. So we never have any, any lack of opportunity to work with someone else at the same time. Um, but I think that there's a lot of um, a, a lack of self-efficacy around the fact that one can control one's oral health. You know, it's like when you grow up in a community where everyone has missing teeth, you just expect you're going to have missing teeth. And in fact, that's that's the norm. That's what one expects. 
And so um, doing some messaging around, this is actually something you can prevent, you know, um, and it, it starts, like, I find there's lots of teachable moments. It's when I'm in the office and the kid starts to cry and the parent pulls out a bottle with Coca-Cola in it. Like that's an opportunity for me to speak right then about, um, you know, it's great that you're trying to respond to your child's need to soothe themselves, but let's talk about a healthier way to do that. Uh, and did you realize this could actually help keep her from having the problems her older brother has? Um, and I think for many of my patients, they, they're the ones who are up at two in the morning with, with children in pain. So they kind of relate to the fact of wanting to try to prevent something when they realize they can. And that, um, and then also talking about it as an infectious disease. And just like we've been wearing masks to try to prevent spread of COVID, we can, there are things we can do to prevent spread of cavities and um, using the messaging around that as prevention. Um, so those are, those are two of the ways I'd start. I, I would say that there is value in messaging to the whole family. Um, we did a study with our, when our, our first iteration of our oral health integration, where we were only doing messages to one child in the family but we actually saw the oral health improve for the whole family uh, because they were taking those messages and sharing it at home. And kids love to be teachers. So the more we can allow them to take their message and share and say, well, did you know that I learned this? You know, they get very excited about it. So, um, yeah. Well, I let the clock run out on us. I, I was so engaged. I didn't realize what time it was. So I just want to take, um, a moment to thank you, Dr. Fisher Owens and our other speakers on being here and just bringing so much information to our community so that we can um, hopefully put some additional practices into place. Really quickly, Ashley's putting some links in the chat. Um, we have an evaluation of our event today. And most importantly, if you would like to receive CDE credits for attending today, um, there is a link there. I'm also going to send a follow-up email since we're rushing here at exactly three o'clock on the dot that will have all of the links. I just want to say thank you so much for being here. I know I learned a lot and we will see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Oh, and if you're still here and want to fill out the poll about continuing the conversation, please fill it out. All right.